welcome everybody and um, big welcome to the results uh, grassroots conference um, conference call for November I hope everyone survived the storms last week and that you're ready to hear about our November campaign action which is on the topic of global education um, so it's an issue we um, kind of regularly return to alongside our work on kind of global health um, issues if this is your first time on our um, results, one of our results monthly conference calls, and welcome. My name's Naveed Chowdhury. I'm the head of um, campaigns at Results UK, and I usually chair these calls. Um, so um, we hold them each month, so you get the chance to hear about this month's advocacy action and how we think that your campaigning is making a difference on the issues that we're working on. And of course, it's our monthly chance to spend time together as a network and just share what we've all been up to. Um, so oh, I'm still admitting people as they're coming in. This is good. Um, so um, usual housekeeping messages. Um, please keep yourself muted during the call. And if you've got any questions or comments, please use the chat box and we'll try and answer your questions there. Um, if, uh, as you can see, we're recording the call. If you're new, please feel free to introduce yourself if you would like, um, and just saying hello now or using the chat function. We'd love to hear where you're calling in from, but it's obviously optional. Great. So um, I'd like to re remind you that as we have done uh, the last couple of calls, um, we're going to keep the call open after the formal end of the meeting at 9 p.m. for an extra half an hour. Um, so if you'd like to, st to, chat, um, to stay and chat informally, you'll be able to. So, you know, just being able to spend time with each other is something I think is really important and something that we expect to be a bit of a, a fixture from now on. And one thing I hope we can start doing is actually, you know, spending a bit more time with uh, face to face um, with each other in the coming year. It was a real delight um, for Aurora and me to be invited to visit the pool group last week. Um, we were all very happy that you weren't washed away in Storm Kieran. <laughs> it was lovely to see, to visit the group, spend time chatting with members. I think Aurora will say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And we're hoping to be able to visit groups more regularly this year. So please expect us to be in touch about that. So I would like to move to our usual roundup of what's going on in the world that's relevant to Results' work. Um, and also a few things that Results staff have been doing since we last met. Um, sadly, I really want to start by referring to the terrible humanitarian situation in Gaza and Israel. Now, um, I think it's important that you know that Results has not issued a public statement because we don't work directly in the region or on conflict as such. But of course, we know that human development is shattered by insecurity and conflict. And of course, like many organizations and people, you know, we're absolutely horrified by the death toll and the unbelievable human suffering um, that's going on. Um, we hope that a solution will be found to end the conflict, at the very least, the ceasefire that's been called for, and that all parties respect international humanitarian law and the rules of warfare to avoid loss of life to civilians, which is obviously very, very far from the reality there right now. Um, moving on from that very sombre topic, I want to say a little bit about some of the work, or want to cover some of the work that Results staff have been doing recently, as I said. We know that you're always interested to, to know a bit more about that. And so firstly, to do that, I'm going to introduce our Parliamentary Advocacy Coordinator, Mallory Thorpe, who I see is on the call, to say a few words about some work that um, the Results Parliamentary team has been doing around the annual political party conference season, um, which was last month. So Mallory, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. Well, this is my first um, grassroots conference call and yeah, very very good to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm the Parliamentary Advocacy Coordinator. Um, so yeah, as maybe that I thought I'd talk a little bit about the um, party conferences that we attended. So the parliamentary team um, attended all three. So the Lib Dem one in Bournemouth, the Conservative one in Manchester, and the Labour one in Liverpool. Um, so if I go sort of through a few takeaways from each. So um, we were slightly disappointed at the Lib Dem conference. There was only one day dedicated to international development events. 
um, and the Lib Dem spokesperson for international development, Leila Moran, didn't actually turn up, which was slightly disappointing. Um, and the general focus of the Lib Dem conference was very much on sort of domestic politics, specifically sort of the NHS and housing, as I guess you'd probably expect. Um, so close to, well, so close, who knows, um, to a general election. Uh, the Conservative Party conference, uh, there weren't many international development events, um, and the ones there were were quite crowded. So Kate, who attended the conference, um, so it was quite hard to find MPs to talk to, and she thought that a lot of Conservative MPs actually um, decided to skip the conference altogether, and it didn't seem like there were many MPs sort of lurking about. Um, the Labour Party conference, which I attended um, alongside Becca and our other colleague Vinny, uh, was a slightly different atmosphere. As you can expect, so the main day on the Tuesday when Keir Starmer delivered his speech was very busy. Um, I thought there were quite a lot of candidates um, about, like, so who were like running in the next election. Um, Labour MPs, I thought, were very cautious about saying things like when we get into government. And it was more sort of, uh, I think they said something like, if we are given the privilege of governing or things like that. So it was sort of like very much not being complacent about getting to power, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, it was also the first time I saw Lisa Nandy in her new role as Shadow Minister for International Development, which is interesting since she was reshuffled from her position in the Shadow Cabinet as levelling up uh, Shadow Minister. Uh, and she also spoke quite a lot, I thought, about um, when it comes to Labour's international development policy, she talked quite a lot about considering the UK's strengths and what the UK could offer the world. So she talked a bit about how... Um, so the UK's sort of strong higher education base and research institutions and how that could be sort of leveraged and used to build similar institutions um, in low income countries or manufacturing bases and providing that like technical assistance. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and she also said about um, that Labour would return to restoring the aid budget to 0.7% of gross national income when the fiscal situation allows. So no sort of massive commitment there for that. Uh, yeah, I think I might leave it there. Thank you very much, Mallory. Uh, it's really great to hear how that piece of work, uh, attending those conferences and picking up that kind of intelligence sits alongside the constituency level work that members of this grassroots network do um, all throughout the year. So, yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for um, joining us this evening. Um, also on the parliamentary front last month, um, our Education Advocacy Officer, Hannah, told you a bit about the debate um, on the SDGs that was happening on the 19th of October. If you were on the call, you'll have heard about that. Hannah's joined us again on this call. And Hannah, would you be able to just very briefly update us on how we think results might have influenced that debate on the Sustainable Development Goals? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Naveed. And hi, everyone. Good to see you again. Um, so on October 19th, um, we had a debate in Westminster Hall on the Sustainable Development Goals um, that I helped organize with Vicky Ford, who is the um, co-chair of the APPG on Global Education. Um, and it went really well um, in the way that it ended up providing a lot of opportunity for us to speak about issues that results campaigns on, including education um, and tuberculosis. Um, and we got um, a couple of shout outs during the debate. Um, Results UK was named as a help by Vicky Ford. And then specifically, one of our campaigners was um, shouted out. Florence um, was part of a letter writing campaign, and she got mentioned during Vicky Ford's speech in the debate, um, the, which was great. That was an amazing highlight. Um, so that was all good. And then also um, Andrew Mitchell attended the debate, which is not super common. And he spoke for 30 minutes, which was particularly exciting um, because that length of time that he was addressing parliament was un uncommon as well. So um, that was all, uh, I think, a huge win. And Florence, again, congratulations on getting mentioned. And I think that it's a really great um, demonstration of what it means to have constituencies behind um, international development issues, because as uh, Mallory mentioned, a lot of people are turning their attention more towards the election, which means that they're spending more time thinking about their constituencies. And if they hear a lot from their um, voter base that they care about international de development, it really helps them get the um, motivation to do things like lead debates and talk about international development. So um, yes, it was all very good. And um, I think that it's something that we can build on in the next couple of 
months with SDGs campaigning that you've got planned. Thanks, Hannah. And yeah, thank you to everybody who helped. Um, well, obviously, who took the the action um, last month and helped to highlight the SDGs, but particularly everybody who helped us um, influence that debate. Thank you so much. You're really affecting British public life for the better in, in what you do. I really believe that. Um, Last month, uh, I also mentioned that the UK government is hosting a so-called Food Security Summit on the 20th of November. That's coming up fast now, with just a couple of weeks to go. We still haven't been told uh, by any of the civil servants what's likely to come out of the event exactly. We know there'll be high-level discussions on a range of nutrition-related topics with experts and representatives from countries around the world. That's kind of it. And we were warned that there's unlikely to be, be big financial commitments that we could influence. And contrary to the, um, the, the minister's interest, uh, he's expressed in having public engagement in international development, there's really not been any engagement with um, the, the, his department, uh, with, with NGOs on, on how to get people in, involved, which is not, uh, it's very frustrating, actually. So what it meant was that on balance, we decided not to ask you to do any campaigning in the run up to the event, or we did think that we might. Uh, instead, uh, we focused on the outcome of the UN meetings back in September, um, but we thought we could do something after that, but we couldn't. Um, as always, we want to make sure that the requests we make on your time and energy are likely to make a significant difference, and we just couldn't see how that was going to work, really. In the longer term, of course, getting more resources deployed to tackle the widespread and um, persistent malnutrition that still plagues so many people around the world is, of course, you know, it's a huge priority for us. And we, so we want to see what kinds of things come out of that conference, if any commitments are made, before deciding what our next steps would be. And so we're likely to have something, we think, maybe in the new year. But right now, we we, we need to see what the outcome of that uh, the debates are that are, to some extent, going to be a bit behind closed doors. Now, as you may have spotted, uh, we've started talking a bit more deliberately about the Sustainable Development Goals since the SDG Summit in New York um, at the UN. Um, so obviously that was the focus of last month's action. If you're able to contact your MP about that, I said a big thank you, and we look forward to hearing about some of that shortly. Um, this month, as we're shortly going to hear, we're focusing on SDG 4, the right to equality education, uh, the lack of which holds back so many uh, children around the world from achieving their potential. Um, so we're going to be hearing about um, the right of children who are displaced to receive an, uh, an education. So that's an important context in which we know that children are all too, all too often not receiving that right. Um, before we talk about that, I want to leap ahead to December. Sorry, this is probably all in the wrong order, but this is how my <laughs> my notes to myself go. Um, as we So um, as we said last month, there's very far from being the political will and public awareness needed for the goals to be at the forefront of the government's mind. And every bit helps, including that debate, but we still need to keep pushing on that over the next seven years. So this is one of the reasons why we've started to mention them a bit more. And this month, we're hoping... Um, some of you may still be able to do more to help publicise the goals. Now, we'll be putting the usual action materials together for December. So next month's uh, call, this time next month. But we're also going to be producing some cards, some f actual physical materials um, uh, this month. Uh, sorry, next month, which you could use as Christmas cards for your family, friends or your MP. So we haven't designed them yet, but they will be SDG themed. And we hope this will be a memorable way for some of you who want to to promote the goals. And you can even customise your own if you're um, interested in campaigning in a more creative way. So we'll put together some, some, some suggestions as we usually do. Um, one of the things we're suggesting is that if there's a Christmas fair or a winter fair in your area, maybe you could hire a stand and share the SDGs with the public. Um, we're telling you this, about this a month in advance because obviously we would need to give you time to plan a public stall. It's not something we've asked groups to consider doing for quite a while now, and I know it can take a bit more time to organise. So we didn't want to just in unveil that idea for the first time at the start of December, because that would be pretty much too late for, for many events. So watch out for those materials in a few weeks. And if you do think it's something you might want to do, if you've got any questions in the meantime, please do get in touch with myself or Aurora. 
So that is it from me. We've had quite a lot of introductory uh, material this time. I'm going to, um, before we hand over to our guest speaker, just want to ask Aurora to share what we've been hearing from you around the UK and if any of you have got actions to share. So Aurora, over to you. Thank you, Navid. I hope you can all hear me well and that my internet holds. Um, so I'm Aurora and the campaign results. If I get to hear, like, um, I am in Brazil right now visiting my family. So please do bear with me if um, the connection kind of was a bit mad, but it seems to be working well, which I'm very pleased about. So um, I wanted to start off by sharing something that was really exciting um, for me personally, which is that I was lucky enough to get to visit and I just one bit and two groups um, last month. And, and that, that was the first group in, in, at the beginning of the month, I went up to Scotland and um, met with Kathy, Karen, Ricky and OJ and we had really some excellent discussions and they were really useful as well in kind of shaping. Um, is my audio really bad, Pete? It's yes. okay, but oh, it's I'm so sorry. There. Okay, I will try and switch off my video. Thank Can you. you hear me a little bit better now, maybe? Seems to be okay for now. Okay. So, yes, I got, um, we had some excellent conversations and then I also saw Bentley and Wendy and Lilin go where um, they gave me some great ideas on how we could include some more positive uh, storytelling and our communication and action materials and to showcase the positive uh, impact of older spending, the real impact. And um, we also had William for, that ha has been a long-standing campaigner in Finland, so um, kind of stepping back from active campaigning. So we uh, sent him off with, uh, you know, really warm wishes and a big thank you for all of his years of also being group leader in the Lindgo. And now uh, it officially all that both groups, Lindgo and Scotland, are merging uh, in Edinburgh, so a merged uh, kind of Scotland um, group, um, uh, which has been in the works anyways. So mm, that seems all really positive, I would say. Um, I was going to ask if someone wanted to share a little bit of how it went, but I think I'm going to uh, advance um, with my updates. Just one second. Um, sorry. Um, so yes, and um, and then last week, it doesn't even seem it seems so far away. Um, Navid and I got to visit Pool. Um, and it was so, so lovely. Helen and Reg organized uh, a really spectacular lunch for us all. Um, many members of the pool group came. We we're more than a dozen people. Uh, and we all fitted really well into the dining room. And it was really lovely to uh, be able to chat with everyone. We'll be sharing some photos of that um, in the news flash. So look out for it. And yeah, it was it was really lovely to be able to answer some questions and also generally just catch up and uh, have some receive some feedback and come up with some ideas um, which will be um, kind of shaping our plans for next year. Um, so moving on, we had um, the, also the online group. I wanted to update you all on on how the online group has been doing, which um, in summary great and um, they've been meeting up regularly now and uh, it was I had that last month it was a very lovely meeting where Kerry also got to share some skills and tricks and tips on how to write to your MP and um, to, uh, speaking of Kerry she um, had a friend of hers that lives in Andrew Mitchell's constituency send him a letter on the ODA campaign and that was the letter that received a personalized reply on that campaign with kind of Andrew Mitchell signing it off themselves and so on. So that was really, really great to see. Uh, everyone else, we had so many people writing to Andrew Mitchell on um, 
uh, official development assistant uh, budget and um, yeah and we we saw many replies come back but um, as you might expect they were all pretty much the same um, didn't say that much but I think we applied some real pressure there and uh, Yes, so many, many thanks to everyone that took that action and also last month action on sustainable development goals. And as Navid has said, we will continue to be focusing on those in different ways. And um, look out for, as Navid said, our December campaign, which will be our kind of street stalls on how to talk to your MP and how to talk to the general public about sustainable development goals and having them send and of Christmas cards to their own MPs. And if you want to attend a workshop that we will be having in December called Campaigning in Everyday Conversations that might prepare you for this, um, these street stalls, then you can do so by um, signing up on Eventbrite. And, and if you are relatively new to results, please do come along to our workshop next week or the week after on the 16th on writing to your MP and we'll write together. Um, which by the way, we did yesterday with a lot of um, other staff. We all wrote together to our own MPs. It was really lovely as well. So that is for me. I will wrap up uh, now so Navid can introduce our lovely speaker. But um, yeah, really, really great um, efforts all around the country. And thank you everyone for all of your advocacy efforts. So with that, I'll pass on to you, Navid. Thank you, Aurora, that's great. Um, so yes, time to introduce our guest speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rebecca Lacking, who is the campaign manager of the Send My Friend to School campaign, which some of you know is hosted by Results. So um, Becca, as we call her, sits with us in the Results office. Um, the Send My Friend to School campaign is a coalition of organisations in the UK campaigning together on education since 2005. It includes NGOs such as Oxfam, Save the Children, and unions such as the National Education Union and the NASUWT. It is also the UK arm of the Global Campaign for Education, so that our efforts are coordinated with others in over 90 countries around the world. So, Becca, welcome. Thanks so much, Avid, and thanks so much for having me. It's so lovely to see some of you again and to meet a lot of you as well. Thanks, Becca. So um, obviously, I'm going to start by telling you who's on this conference call. But as you know, our grassroots network includes people from right around the country and including both people who've been working with um, results for many, many years and others who are really quite new. Um, so in a minute, we're going to go to the usual process of asking for some pre-arranged uh, questions to get the discussion started. But before that, um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you came to be involved with the work you do at Send My Friend. How did you get involved with campaigning on access to education and why does it matter to you personally? Oh, wow. Yeah, big question. Um, yeah, so I... Um, I trained as a English teacher, a secondary school English teacher in the UK um, and worked as an English teacher for a few years and loved teaching, loved education and like definitely, I don't know if there are any teachers on this call um, or anyone who's done any education before, um, but just there is something absolutely incredible about working with young people um, and became, if I'm honest, like quite quickly disillusioned with the school system and kind of really sort of found my way into doing more kind of campaign work. I started doing a lot of um, campaigning with um, refugees and looking at refugee rights within the UK and then doing some programme work in Greece and um, before like doing my master's degree in education and international development. And so I kind of came through, came into campaigning through the issue area rather than campaigning itself. And then really, I think working with people um, working just with kind of normal people not policy people and um, that is no offense to policy people I very much like working with my colleagues but I think the thing that makes the real impact and I think we've heard actually so much about like the amazing impact that kind of the actual grassroots campaigning does 
I think that's where all the kind of really exciting stuff happens um and so yeah it's like doing and um, working at semi friend school and I we we have kind of grassroots campaigner in a similar in a similar way to um results do with with you but we work a lot with young people so we work with school age children just because we think some of the best advocates for um, education are children because they're still in education. Uh, so we find that that link works really well. Thank you, uh, Becca. Um, that's really great to hear your kind of personal route into this. And um, I'm sure you'll get some more questions a bit later on. Uh, but so let's go to those prearranged questions before we open up to the floor. And I think the first one is coming from Scotland. Am I right? Yes, I think that's right. Um, it's Hello. Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, I'm um, asking something about education because I think it's very important. And I know that your campaign's been going for some years. We've been aware of it for quite a while. Um, one of the things we know is we've had global targets for getting children into school for many years now. Are we getting any closer to achieving them or not um yeah no thanks for the question so i think yeah so we, we started off with the millennium development goals and and the education goal there was really focused on exactly that getting children into school and around access um and when the sustainable development goals were drafted i think one of the things that came about with that drafting process was to kind of look beyond access and actually look towards a quality and inclusive education because actually I think what is really important is getting kids in school actually just isn't enough um, if the quality of their learning isn't kind of there so I think that's kind of, I think that is definitely a really positive development of the last sort of 20 years of having the global goals um, are we getting close to achieving them um, I think sadly we are quite off track and um, even before COVID-19 the world was pretty off track to meet the targets and the pandemic kind of globally has meant that many of those games were lost and the impact has been heaviest on children who are most vulnerable um, and if we do continue on the kind of path at the pace that we're going at only one in six uh, countries are going to meet sustainable development goal for by 2030 and um, and I think one of the things that's really exacerbated this is like is, is the kind of the increase of sudden disruptions over the last kind of 10 years or so and particularly recently that do just deprive millions of children of their learning opportunities so we're talking about conflict climate change COVID-19 but more often than not and I think Naveed touched on this is this sort of poly crisis and these overlapping crises um that mean that children aren't able to access that education and um, whether that's earthquakes in Turkey and Syria or the hunger crisis in East Africa and um, education does seem like it's under quite extreme threat at the moment and the numbers of children whose education is being impacted by emergencies at current rates looks to be about 224 million um, at the moment however um, I don't want the scale of the problem to kind of inspire the sense of inertia my my concern over some of the narratives around the sustainable development goals generally is saying we're off track we're off track we're not going to achieve them um but actually we can achieve them um and there are there are kind of real solutions that require political will um, and particularly with sustainable development goal four which is particularly off track comparatively is i think is is a recognition of education kind of as a bit of a bedrock but as an interconnected issue with other issue areas um, just for kind of one example there are such clear links between education and climate justice and climate change education is not just kind of a huge victim to climate change if we're looking at kind of school buildings routes to schools being destroyed um, mass displacement um, for example like uh, after the floods in Pakistan there was two, 22,000 schools closed and 3.5 million children and education being halted so education is a huge victim to climate change, but it also needs to be seen um, kind of as a big part of the solution um, and kind of the impact that resilient education systems can actually have, um, like training children like for green jobs, kind of supporting them if they are in countries that and communities that are affected heavily by climate change. Um, it's got to be seen as part of the solution. Um, 
and and also within that kind of thinking about other things foundational literacy and numeracy and kind of the importance of making sure that those basic skills are met inclusive education systems gender responsive education systems so I think are we on track no could we be on track yes um but we kind of need that political backing I think behind it thank you Becca um I'm sure there's a lot to unpack there when we get into opening the questions up to the floor. Um, that one in six figure is absolutely stark. Um, that's, that feels a lot worse than when I first started doing my own uh, campaigning on education quite a few years ago now. Um, and um, yeah, the, the narrative around disruption of education is something that you will see in, in a lot of our I spent about quite a long time talking on mute there. Apologies. No, it was just about a second, Snobby. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I turned my mute on, on, on and off then. So yeah, um, you'll see that in our narrative around around education, and including in this month's action materials, which I'm just putting in the um, in the chat box. So the second question. Let's move to uh, Stort Valley, I believe. Hi there, I'm Jill. Um, my question is around conflict situations. How can children in conflict situations get an education safely? Yeah, thanks, Jill. Um, I think it kind of, Navid's uh, brought this up at the beginning of the call, but I think it's a point that bears repeating that actually in times of conflict, protection of all civilians and civilians' rights, but um, in particular, the rights of children um, is so important that they're seen kind of as a central to all humanitarian approaches and we know that there are a globally agreed set of um, human rights um, and one of those rights is to an education but how do we make sure that that is realized um, education in emergencies is life-saving and life-protecting and safe and supportive learning spaces can provide children with the skills to escape crises to build their resilience and adaptive capacity to withstand hazards and also I think what is really critical is when children are surveyed um, and this is on top of kind of anything uh, that education comes out top and I think that's because education really just has the power to sustain hope for a brighter future um, and that I think the statistic I'm sorry if I'm wrong about this but I think they are twice as likely to rank going to school as their top concern compared to kind of other immediate needs whether it's food or, or water and um, and so kind of broadly speaking, because uh, because I think it's different in different contexts, right? And that's kind of an important thing as well is that host governments um, and the international community need to kind of learn um, from the data that's available, but also make sure that education is kind of contextually appropriate. Um, and we're not just talking about school. I think that's it's not just what's happening in a building, non-formal education and kind of different ways that education um, can be adapted. Um, but but what what does it look like to have you know an inclusive resilient gender responsive education system that can withstand hazards so that children's education isn't disrupted um and i think one big one again big thing about this is financing and political will and um, is that sustainable development goal four and education more generally is prioritized both by governments international communities um as kind of something that's sort of majorly built into humanitarian response plans and um, because it's true that most like many emergencies can be at least somewhat predicted and prepared for uh, and that can include things like disaster risk reduction programs and um, conflict mitigation climate change adaptation resilience building and um, and also seeing education as part of you know a short-term solution but but kind of really importantly something that can bridge the gap uh, in kind of a longer term kind of process um, and and kind of thinking about what that looks like for for sort of children who like are, are learning in kind of conflict zones and actually how that can be at all sustainable um, but yeah I think it, it definitely goes further than just thinking about buildings um, which is often I think the first thing people do think of but also, one of the things that we're talking about is child protection, about safeguarding, about mental health and psychosocial support, how it's gender inclusive as well. Um, and then just so, yeah, la I guess last thing I'd say about this question is um, how do you get an education safely is is actually it's not 
education, I think, is often seen or we talk about it as an absolute good, um, but it's not an absolute good, nor is it neutral. And I think virtually everywhere um, it's unequally distributed or un of an uneven quality. So I think seeing education as a vehicle for fostering creative and social innovations and also thinking about curriculum itself and what a critically reflective education can do to sort of support valuing diversity and sustainability. So um, I think it's a, that's a really convoluted answer. I really apologize, but I think it, it's different in different contexts, but actually having it prioritized in the first place is so important because it's so underfunded. Um, I think only it only receives 3.1% of global humanitarian financing generally um, and only receives 22% of the funds that it requires. Um, so I think funding, but also the, the process itself. Thank you, uh, Becca. It's clearly, you know, very context dependent and, and, and complex. Um, we'll move on to our third question so that we can get as much time for, for other questions. So I think the online group is someone in the online group is going to ask that question. Yes. Hello, I'm Florence. Um, my question is, um, how can we as campaigner help to ensure the UK is contributing as much as it should be to funding um, the global education? Thank you. Thanks, Florence. Um, yeah, great. another great question. So this, the timing of this kind of monthly action is, is really a useful one because we have two uh, landmark opportunities coming up um, for the UK government to sort of demonstrate that they are committed to all children accessing education during a time of crisis. And this is COP28 and um, the Conference of the Parties, but I actually think the acronym is probably easier than Conference of the Parties and the Global Refugee Forum, which you might also see referred to as the GRF. Um, and so at both of these events, what what we kind of want from the UK government is to see ambitious commitments to address these shared challenges, strengthen global resilience, and ultimately really protect children's rights to education. Um, so at COP, this is about ensuring that education is systematically integrated into the global climate agenda. It's, I think, the first year that there is a day dedicated to education. So it's about thinking, I think I gave an example in the first question about kind of education and kind of climate resilience um, education system. So actually looking at education in terms of just transitions and equitable access to uh, green transitions for marginalized groups of children. So that might look like green skills development, employment, fairer education outcomes, and um, also looking at financing. So increased education financing um, and new financing. I think that's really key. We're not asking for finance to be taken out of other pots or taken out of existing climate structures, but for new financing um, to be delivered and also thinking really about loss and damage funds and championing the need for significant finance for loss and damage to be directed towards education. And a really big and important one, I think is really often missed out. And this is kind of applicable for both COP and the GRF, the Global Refugee Forum, is actually just really making sure that the rights and voices of children are really heard at each level and um, in the operalization um, of kind of that financing and that they're being consulted. And when we're talking about the Global Refugee Forum, actually consulting with, you know, with refugee communities, with refugee led organizations and um, with the communities who are affected that's really important. And if you're asking questions in your letters, um, that's a really good one to ask, like what consultation is happening? What's like with, with um, kind of the communities affected? Um, and then at the Global Refugee Forum, alongside what I've just mentioned, um, one thing to ask for is, is actually kind of mobilizing the funding needed to support low and middle income hosting countries to provide a quality education for refugee and host community children. And um, so it's this is about like the whole international community um, coming together and delivering really strong commitments on education and the UK particularly as well to make its own ambitious pledges, including more and better financing for refugee education, support for some of the multilateral funds like the Education Cannot Wait, um, GPE and the World Bank to coordinate their financing um i think you did a, an action about a year ago for education cannot wait so we, we did indeed yeah. You did. yeah great so i think you're probably quite familiar um but just really this is also about supporting host governments and particularly the poorest countries who often kind of have 
the most refugees um, coming and sharing kind of that financial um, burden across uh, the international community. Um, and then, yeah, another really big one, and this was really missing at the Global Refugee Forum four years ago, is actually what effective monitoring, tracking and reporting mechanisms are going to be there. Um, there's no point making pledges if there's nothing in place to keep uh, people accountable to them. So what monitoring, tracking and reporting mechanisms are going to be put in place as well? Um, so, and, and I think also drawing on, I think last month uh, with your gen more general SDG ask and looking at ODA and the cuts, how that's impacting education as well. So I think it's always worth kind of asking about UK ODA and how um, kind of that, that return to 0 0.7 and why that's important and how the impacts that's had as well. Thanks, Becca. So lots of ideas there for things that you can say, uh, ideas for your your communications on this. Um, obviously, we're often asking for money and that may be sometimes quite hard with this government at this time, but last month, month before, remember we got that over not nearly half a billion dollars for uh, for health um, coming out of the um, the UN high level meetings. So, you know, we can do it again for education. I'm sure you can. Um, OK, we need to open up the floor to questions. So um, I'm just as usual, you can just unmute and just ask your question. Uh, just introduce yourself first or you can uh, text me. That's my number. I've just put in the chat box 07906 662 571. That's 07906 662 571. Or you can type it into the chat box yourself. So lots of options there. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, who's who's going to be the first with the, with the question? Anyone uh, just want to unmute hello. yourself? Hello, hello. Pete, go ahead. Yeah, a uh, parochial question, really. It's just someone I'm in contact with in Uganda, a young man <clears throat> who may or may not be on this call. I don't know. Um, his problem is that it's illegal for him to work if he's a teenager, so he cannot afford school fees. That is that particular angle something that comes under the umbrella of the actions that we focus on um yeah thanks peter that is that's a really interesting question so under sustainable development goal four i think one of the things that we forget to kind of shout about the importance of is the fact that education needs to be free um and a good pub i can see hannah really nodding so i might actually pass her in a minute just because i know um this is a particularly interesting area of hers education needs to be free and it needs to be public um and what one concern I think that there is, is from the UK government is kind of British international investment into kind of privatised education systems and support of education systems that are not free. Um, because alongside every child should, every child should have the right to a free, to an access to a quality education. It also needs to be free because otherwise that's only going to exacerbate inequality and um, kind of increase marginalisation. So yeah, I think it's always worth uh, mentioning and, and I think saying you know if you're talking about global health like the privatization of kind of global health and global education systems is a, is a massive concern and something that we don't want to see the government supporting so I think yeah there's definitely a place to be lobbying for that. Thank you. Um, okay let's have another question thank you for that. Ricky, I see you put a question in the chat. Did you want to read it out or do you want me to? Uh, I can um, just ask it. Um, thanks for joining us, Rebecca. Thanks for your um, talk so far. Um, I thought I might have misheard. Uh, I was scribbling down notes and I thought you said that there's a system in Brazil for presenting or... Um, at least accommodating if education gets interrupted. Um, I'd never heard of that. That sounds really interesting. Can you tell us more? I did. I think you might have misheard me, Ricky. I didn't mention Brazil. Um, no. <laughs> however, what I will say is there is a really amazing project happening in Brazil at the moment. It's called the CETA project, S-E-T-A, through an organisation called Action Aid, which is basically doing kind of a seven-year longitudinal 
work um, to look at anti-racist transformational, transformational education in Brazil at the moment. So okay. I, would, I would definitely kind of have a look at that. It's kind of looking um, like bringing kind of loads of civil society government um, actors to kind of work on transformation of the public school system um, and also particularly looking at data of black indigenous populations um, and their kind of school data which kind of because they're often not underperforming um, mm. so to look at racial equity so I didn't mention it but they're definitely worth checking out. <laughs> yeah well okay so um, the, the, the question of and education being interrupted particularly with things like conflicts and natural disasters that's obviously um is really damaging for education so i'm just wondering if there is um you know kind of mechanisms available or ideas as to how um how that can be addressed yeah so one um kind of thing that that we know kind of does work in lots of contexts is something called disaster risk reduction um, mm -hmm. and lots of different kind of organizations do that in different ways and there's also the Sendai framework that you can have a look at as well um, which I can share links to um, but that's about mitigation preparedness yeah. response and recovery recovery sorry yeah. um, and so kind of looking at the protection of school systems and um, I do, yeah. I think I always have to be careful because I think I use the word school a lot and I don't mean school, I mean education. Um, education doesn't just have to happen in school. Um, and yeah, I think Hannah's just posted in the chat as well mm -hmm. that there are lots of transformative yeah. education models coming up Brazil. I completely agree. I think it's a, it's a really, they, they've done a lot of really fantastic stuff over the years and there's some like really amazing, amazing um, education philosophers um, and pedagogues. Uh, so yeah, people who are interested in reading more, happy to share info. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, we have a very topical question in the chat box from Jill. Uh, Jill, do you want to read that out or do you want me to? You're on Just mute. On mute. I'm, I'm mute, yeah. Um, I listened to the King's speech this today, which was setting out uh, what his government is going to do, and he read it between clenched teeth, really. Um, but one of the things that they're doing is that they're going to tinker with the A-level system. Um, you know, they're going to do more technical stuff. But they stress the importance of education. Um you know that of a good education it might be something to mention in letters that's that's all have a look at the the king's speech and see what they're actually saying you know the government that's all yeah, <laughs> it might be a bit of a hawk you know yeah always looking for some way of making our actions more topical uh relevant to the the agenda that the government's got so yeah really good spot Joe. thank you for that uh, any other questions? We've got a few few minutes left, which is good. Can I sneak another one in while I've got the mic on? Um, could you put a link in? Could you put a link in the chat box to the education cannot wait materials that we had before? I'm I'm trying to find them and I can't find them on my system. Um, I'll do that. I don't, know, I don't know when it was. I remember doing it and I'm going click click click. Um, it might be of relevance. It Sorry. is. Thank you for mentioning it, because we did have two speakers sort of the middle of last year, I think. And I think they talked about some really practical things that Education Cannot Wait does mm. um, to support host governments um, in, uh, you know, in dealing with the, uh, education in refugee situations, at least. So right, I, yeah. I remember I found it. It was um, it was this time last year of that. November. Mm. Yeah, I'm just putting it in the chat now if anyone wants to see the link to that. Um, and there was a conference call, which I will also try and find as well. Whilst, Brilliant, um, thank you. Because well, they were, I, I, I remember they had quite a lot to say between the two of them. They did, which is relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Quickly, Jill, to your um, kind of previous point, which I think is a really good one um, to kind of link it to what the government is saying about education at the moment, is that I think an education interrupted is quite a tangible thing because we all saw the impacts of COVID on the UK system. Um, but we also saw what could happen 
oh, like the first time round, no one was prepared for online learning. I was still teaching at the time. I didn't know what Teams was. I'd never done a Zoom call. Um, and it was really, really challenging. Second time round, um, things were set up. Students kind of knew how to do online learning. Teachers had got better at it. Um, and so those systems were in place. And I think that is probably quite a good example of thinking about, well, actually, how can you make an education system resilient and how can you learn from things? Because whilst that was what was happening in the UK, and of course, we know that the education system wasn't perfect and there's been kind of learning lost time for kids in, in the UK, a lot of schools kind of across the world, number one, weren't set up to do anything online. Um, but even if you just chuck a laptop at somebody, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to kind of have the digital literacy to use it. So I think thinking about a resilient system is thinking about what can we kind of learn from sort of previous things that have happened um, and kind of previous like similar um, events, but also how different places adapt in different ways. Um, but I think that, that there are kind of ways to talk to you in your letters if you could potentially make that comparison or draw those links, like as Jill says about um, the King's speech, or we know Rishi Sunak, it got very obsessed for a while with maths so if there's anything you know about your MPs and kind of how they feel about education um or even if you have links with schools in your sort of local area and um, then I think it's also as well we're semi-friend we work with young people but there are hundreds of thousands of young people across the UK who are sort of demanding the same as, as what you are for their sort of crisis affected peers across the world so I think demonstrating that mandate through that can be quite useful Great. Thank you, Becca. Um, Hannah's just posted something in the chat. Hannah, I wondered if you wanted to just follow up with that. Um, not sure if everyone will have read it. Sure. Yeah, I didn't want to take away from Becca's Becca's answer because it was really good. But there was just, a, I think, a really poignant um, line that came from uh, Judith Herbertson at the FCDO that um, when we're talking about priorities in like international development and even within the UK that education is a priority that is always at risk of being deprioritized because it's not a crisis um it's not like you know people not being able to drink water or access water or food or um you know healthcare um so it's not seen as this life or death thing but um if you think about it things in the long term like it really is a, it is like a huge part of life and something that needs to be prioritized and it needs and something that we all kind of really resonate with I think and we all understand how important it is but when it comes down to creating budgets it gets cut quite often um, against other things and it has generational impacts so it like what gets cut now is something that gets um, played out over a lifetime um, so thanks yeah. thanks Hannah um yeah, I have just seen also, thank you, Jill, for posting um, a link to an article there, if people want to go and have a look at that, about a practical example for education in a conflict situation. I look forward to uh, to reading that as well. Um, I'm also just going to share a link in our action materials, which I, I linked to a little bit earlier on, but we sent them out to you in an email as usual. Um, there's a reference to a report from the Send My Friend to School um, campaign on education in crises. So that you can link to that, you can get to it through our action materials, or just follow the link there in the in the chat as well. Um, thought it would be worth just flagging that up because it's um, really great set of recommendations for parliamentarians on the two um, kind of conferences that we've just been talking about and that Becca um, kind of outlined. Um, also, I just wanted to say I have probably unfairly raised expectations around the conference call for about education cannot wait last last November. Um, I have been reminded when I went to go and find it and couldn't that we had technical issues with the recording. So I'm afraid that isn't actually available. But we do have um, the action materials, which might have a little bit, um, it will certainly have links through to education cannot wait, which is one of the main um, funding routes for um, the UK and other donors to get um, fund, funding through to, um, to education programmes. Um, okay, let's We've still got time for probably one or two other questions, depending on how short the answers are. So um, just again, opening it up to the floor or post in the chat. I don't think I've got anything in on text yet. I'm not writing a question. Naveen. 
It's Reg here from Paul. Hi, Reg. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, I mean, one of the most important elements or objectives of the GPE is uh, gender equality. Are there any particular concerns about that when we're considering disasters and climate change? Are there particular aspects that affect girls in getting education? Um, yeah, great question. Um, yes, uh, hugely. Um, girls are disproportionately affected um, during times of emergencies, and that can be kind of for a multitude of reasons. Um, your I, I, apologies, I don't have the stats to hand, um, but rates of child marriage of teen pregnancy um, are kind of yeah, exponentially higher during times of emergencies and displacement. Often, if families are forced to make difficult choices about which child goes to school, it will be the boy over the girl. Um, and gender-based violence um, and FGM, uh, female genital mutilation, rates get a lot higher during times of emergency as well. So it's kind of the impact of education kind of massively disproportionately affects girls. And also just, I, I suppose, like back to one of the questions about how do you make kind of schools or education systems safe, it's, it's making sure Part of that is about a gender responsive and gender inclusive education systems. And that includes so many things, such as making sure that students are protected from sexual violence in school, um, that they're kind of, if like young teen mothers are given opportunities to go back to school um, and can learn, that there's good wash facilities um, for kind of feminine hygiene. Um, so, yeah, get, that's it's a really great question, Reg, and thanks for kind of bringing it up. But yeah, it's really. Um, kind of a massive issue for girls education and if particularly yeah it's it's a big the con current conservative government's education team has called the girls education team that was kind of really pushed under Boris Johnson's administration um, and they still have their special envoy on girls education so um, is is definitely a good thing to mention I think if you are writing letters. Thank you. Um, Becca, that's great. I think we have run out of time now. So um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to you for sharing your expert knowledge with us this evening, as well as to our other staff speakers. And thank you for everyone's questions. Um, I'm really, yeah, very um, grateful for you bringing your um, perspective on education. And also I, one thing I've always enjoyed is that unique perspective of school children themselves. Um, fighting for the right to education with their uh, for their peers around the world and it's a great pleasure to work alongside send my friend campaign um and have have them in the office um and we've drawn quite heavily on their um, expertise and materials for the um, action materials this month so huge thank you to um, becca and her team thank you to all of you for joining us on the call as always i hope it's been useful and that many of you will be able to take this month's action um, so I've linked that in the chat box already. And so we really want to be doing that building political support we need to achieve SDG4, but particularly in this current context of emergencies with these two conferences coming up. Lastly, just a reminder that we will be keeping the line open for an extra half an hour for anyone who feels inclined to stay for a bit of a chat. If you uh, don't want to do that, Please, of course, feel free to hang up, <laughs> of course. Um, but just before you do go, I wanted to say a couple of things about the next two conference calls. Um, the next monthly call will be on Tuesday, the 5th of December at the usual time. And so, as I said, we'll be going back to the theme of the sustainable development goals and some creative campaigning around those. However, the January call, we are moving. Uh, we often move it from the first Tuesday because it's just straight after New Year, which means we don't have any time to produce materials for you. But we're not going to move it to the following Tuesday. We're going to move it to the following Thursday, which is the 11th of January. Now, I hope this isn't going to stop too many people from joining us, but we really wanted to have Kitty, our CEO, to be able to join us. And she has a a regular commitment on a Tuesday, um, which has um, been a disappointment for, for a lot of you, I know. So we have um, hopefully going to be able to um, get together with her on the 11th of January, um, which is a Thursday, and that for the first um, action of the new year, we hope we'll be sharing something about our strategy so we can let you in on as much as we know of what we're going to be doing over the coming year. Um, that will just be a one-off, but I hope it's not going to stop you from joining the first call of 2024. So as always, it's been really, really great to share time with you. 
And um, for those of you who are leaving the call now, um, enjoy the rest of your evenings.